Today I speak to you wearing multiple hats as a multimedia artist, designer, and also as a songwriter and musician. I hope to show bridges between technology and the humanities, technology and the healing arts, and look at ways in which we can reduce and reverse the entrapment facing participants of the digital society. In my earlier presentation at this forum in 2018, I had shown how the founding fathers of the personal computing revolution would be horrified to see the clutter, the privacy and health-related side effects of what contemporary computing applications have turned out to be. They would especially be displeased in seeing how today's computing experiences have strayed from the idealistic visions of the 1970s. The 70s and 80s visions of computing envisioned the pursuit of knowledge lying in harmony with the pursuit of creativity and lying in harmony with nature. While the topic of entrapment is broad and cover entrapment across a range of fields and levels from globalized economies and their media, energy and commodity dependence of world economies, underlying all of the applications of technology lies the individual who learns, who works, who plays with and through the digital medium. So with health and well-being as our goal, at a larger level, this talk speaks to the redesign of technology for a calm society. A society which will know ways and means for people to stay in the technogrid for their dependence on the digital marketplace, but also one which will know how to exit off the technogrid to maintain one's health and well-being. While recognizing that man, the info man, the hyperconnected man, by nature, in terms of the neurochemistry of his mind, is an insatiable and a curious being, that is, someone who is constantly engaged in lifelong learning despite one's aging body. And while recognizing the positive dimensions of contemporary technology in supporting instantaneous learning, interaction with technology comes at a huge cost of entrapment. We are going through a great trough of disappointment. My own journey into the research and design of technology was a journey in inventing new tools to deal with the entrapments presented by the then and previous media. When text was felt to be trapping, we invented multimedia. Example, the world's first multimedia desktop system, the first learning systems. When mouse and button interfaces on the desktop were seen to be entrapping, we explored gestures as a means of interaction. When black and beige boxes enslaved us, we broke out of the box. And through ornamentation, we transformed computers into personalized cultural computers. We integrated ornaments into the design and looked into the way in which communities could personalize and humanize their technology. Instead of holding cold black and beige boxes, we explored how people can touch naturally breathing, naturally healing materials. We detoxed the hardware and explored interactions with natural materials. We explored breath interfaces, allowing people to sing along, speak to, speak with, and breathe along with our multimedia works. We explored hugs as a calming interface. We worried about the payback to the village, and we are still looking at ways to bridge the urban-rural and design and digital divides. Exploring hardware design with village crafts so that the economic benefits of the technology space can also go to the farming communities, that is, communities that feed us in the urban areas. And now, while we were pursuing the idealism of the 1970s, the 80s and the 90s, suddenly in the 2000s, with the rise of the digital oligarchs, we woke up to a very different digital world. We found ourselves in a nightmare of clutter and fragmentation. 
On the desktop, one has to switch between so many tasks to get something simple done. So one level of entrapment at the desktop level can be taken to mean the lack of seamless flow and the switching between multiple modes, tools, tasks, just to get simple tasks done. This is in contrast to the flows occurring in other practices. The internal clutter on our workspaces is mirrored in the external world consisting of relentless ads and a clutter of choices. And indeed, the curse of abundance is that we are paralyzed by the inability to choose. With infinite notifications, we are in performance anxiety, so much so that three little bouncing dogs, just three dogs, can frighten us with the flight or fight response. And amidst this toxic clutter, in our mind spaces, in our mindscapes, we become addicted to never-ending information updates. So the media of freedom and redemption made in the 1970s by freedom-loving computer scientists who saw technology as a spiritual savior and as an enabler of freedom has now turned into a health hazard with technology becoming an addictive substance in the 2020s. At the center of this is the mind's production of the pleasurable dopamine neurotransmitter, the reward for clicking on information updates. With increased technology use, the dopamine release of the mind became more dependent on technology and media content and gradually less and less on the dimensions and experience of human touch with real living beings. And more and more clicks with devices and media raised the bar on the additional innovation and thrill required to achieve previously achieved pleasure states. So much so that we are losing engagement with the present moment as we are always displaced into the future. We are never in the now, but the future is only a plan which will happen some other day, not in the here and now. We should be asking, at what point does the techno-man's curiosity for knowledge and information updates become an addiction? And at what point does killer content become deadly? Of course, there are common sense, street smart, non-digital, analog means to restore ourselves. And these have been handed down as collective inheritances from time immemorial. It might be worth to note and review some of these. These include movement, stretches, cycle of postures, control of breath, and diets that reduce stress due to media and digital work-induced inflammation. We can additionally learn from a traditional society's notion of detox. In the past, one form of cultural expression, the pilgrimage, served also as a detox, an exercise to get rid of stress. And by design, the pilgrimage is a difficult physical exercise involving physical hardship and fasting to reach a site of sacred geography, which is transformative. For example, people come from all over the world to interact with the symbolic and natural power of the Ganges River in Benares. And the river is seen as a physical, supernatural, mythological and symbolic hotspot. People come to gaze at, touch, fast in the presence of and perform penances by the river Ganges. Similarly, Arabian nations have a low incidence of cancer rates because of fasts and built into their worldview and lifestyle. Therefore, we could study correspondences between past practices and past wisdom that will be useful for the digital world. For example, the techno detox and the techno fasts. These include common sense practices like checking into solitude. Solitude doesn't mean shutting off from the social media or social connection or just the practice of silence. It means shutting the mind's thought-based identity and ego to let the light shine in. And yet another common sense practice. Although we live in abundance, 
the techno man's galloping minds has no time to meditate on the gratitude for their gifts or to enjoy the bliss of serving the others. Instead of being appreciative of the magic of being in the here and now, they are anxiously pushing buttons to get to or to gain something in the future. Addicted to social media, our fragile self craves likes. Social media is the thief of joy as it forces comparison and comparisons make us a lot miserable. We trace the origins of this to the face match browser in Harvard's dorms. If we extrapolate from face match's origins to today, little has changed. Social media's models of monetizing comparisons come as no surprise since social networking traces its origins to a browser, one that compares two pictures of female students. And as the social media browsers grew in scale, the comparisons too have grown in scale. And I might add the misery too. So from the comparison of form and Harvard dorms, we have a situation of the comparison of ideologies today. And in doing so, the media has colonized our subconscious with fear and hatred. Research has shown how social media is designed to favor certain negative posts and keep people scrolling for much longer. So what was once promised as a medium to unite the world has now tilted towards becoming a medium of ideological competition and division. But it could be wrong for us to blame the browsers entirely as the history of media shows us that we dwell more on the negative than on the positive. A comparison of newspaper headlines across time will show our unending misery. We could also perhaps reflect on whether this misery is a perennial condition. That is, it's in the nature of mind. It's the mind that designs technology. And so unless we ground the mind in values of compassion, peace and love, no new technology can be designed to solve the violence that animates us or the violence that envelops us. Let me now switch back to the design at the interface level, coming to the interface experience. There's still the missing dimension of energy in our interactions, dimensions which in analog human communications and in the practice of arts and crafts have been considered to be important. While pictures and sounds can be digitized into JPEGs and PNGs, the dimension of touch, which is an irreplaceable part of communication, is as of yet unrepresented. Traditional societies, which are rooted in nature, had explored these hidden channels of communication, which extend from the ectoplasm of the physical body cages to embrace nature and beings outside. So one could really say that this was the traditional vision of the internet. Here, communication doesn't stop at the ectoplasm of the bounding box of the body. Instead, halos, envelope, and energies move from beyond the body envelope and embrace all of space outside. And so this brings me to entrapment of the hands and the loss of the hand skills. And so, with the growing dependence on buttons and swipes on screens, we must remember to ask, are we losing our hand skills? Are we losing our mind skills too? This brings me to the symbolism of the spinning wheel. In India's freedom struggle, the charka, the spinning wheel, a classical symbol of Buddhism, that is the Buddhist dharmic wheel, was transformed into a political, social, economic, and spiritual tool. The hand-spun cotton allowed the Indians to alter their products of consumption, that is, to create sustainable clothing, thereby avoiding the purchase of the colonizers, materials, and commodities. Performance of hand skills was an essential part of India's freedom struggle. But this focus on handmade products and handmade crafts hid the benefits of the hand-mind connection lying in plain sight, one in which the acquisition of and the engagement with 
physical skills and body-based expertise allows for healing and well-being through neuroplasticity. So the question for us is, can we reskill the hands? At a larger level, all these interactions with buttons and screens entrap the minds of the hyper-connected man. Entrapment here in this context means hyper-connected man is caged into the belief of a measurement-based determinism and this creates a reductionist mindset and this places dark imprints on the techno man's subconscious mind so much so that we become programmed to see people as icons or as windows and inherit a mistaken perception that people are buttons to be pushed or icons to be clicked. So while button pushing on computer screens is a boolean operation occurring almost instantaneously, turning off or transitioning between emotional states in people is in nature, in contrast, not instantaneous. It can take hours, days or even years. And the world is not a desktop. In all of this, work never ends. Dimensions of technology haven't reduced work proportionately. And as a result, we owe ourselves sleep, the minimal time required for the body to repair and to reheal. And ironically, this sleep debt lies proportional to the burgeoning economic debt in developing nations and to the debt owed to humanity by decision makers in not taking decisions on ecological awareness. And as a result, the world lies in a deep slumber, in a suspended animation, when it comes to the decision of taking action on the status quo of climate change. And although we partially sleep or are asleep, big tech, big brother never sleeps. It's constantly monetizing its users' data and attention. So we ask, isn't it time for big tech to offer royalties to their users for hijacking their attention and for surveilling them? Therefore, we eagerly await the launch of the new browser where we can cancel the extra sugar. We can cancel the cookie order and free us from the commercialization of our attention in the limited time we have left remaining on planet Earth. And with the impending AI revolution lies another tsunami of unimaginable entrapment and the possibility of self-extinction. If we haven't yet designed basic tools, imagine what would happen if we expect the badly designed tools to automate and learn and to redesign themselves. So it's also time to re-ask, hey, what happened to the promise of the equitable world? What happened to the redistribution of equity and opportunity? What happened to that flat space? Why has the world conveniently become more and more spiky? We also ask, should the few digital oligarchs forever impose their thoughts and expression on the rest of us? That is the imposition of the few on the collective especially the imposition of one set of people on other cultures which may not believe in any form of domination. Example, people practicing the philosophy of ahimsa, non-violence, and cultures which are rooted in ecological values. Why entrap them? So, with the unending change that lies ahead, with the many disappointments facing us, and the impacts that economies have on the physical world, our toxic cities, our toxic oceans, toxic air, and the threats to the environment, especially in the developing economies, where tech stimulates economy, and many cultures embrace the new digital economy, and the new economy creates environmental degradation and unplanned urbanization, and the resulting clutter of pollution. And so with these threats to the environment, we are at a tipping point. So when the history of computing will be written, it will describe the 2020s as a time when computing got sick, 
Indeed, this could have been the title of this talk. And so we look to the time when tech paid attention to its artists and healers. That is, the creative class and the healing class to draw from their innate wisdom and become involved in the redesign of technology. The world's artists, performers and health practitioners, among others, that is the creative and the healing class, can draw from their innate wisdom and redesign new devices, interfaces and experiences. So it's time to break free and it's time to exit the valley and take a hard look in the rear view at what we have built till now. And we may need to do a control Z, going backwards to retrace our steps, to rebrace for change, and do a control C in a loop backwards to arrive back to a point in time where we can live in harmony with nature and to live both on the grid as well as learn to live by switching off the grid for our renewal. Therefore, it's a time for redesign and to live in a world where technology honors nature and contributes and maintains the wellspring of nature. And here nature is seen as a sustainer of life in which all life live in a harmonious balance. Thank you.